the one job that President Biden has to do is to protect the United States of America from enemies, foreign and domestic, right? His job is to protect our nation. And he is failing to do that. But it scares me that we're kind of asleep at the wheel and we're not realizing that our adversaries see our weakness and are using that weakness to target us. Our border is in chaos. We have the Chinese uh, corporate uh, companies connected to President Xi Jinping and the Communist Party buying land in America. We are worried about the future of our nation. And we have the Dems in charge of the Senate and our House GOP is doing everything possible right now, I believe, to try to stop this insanity in our country. And one of those that is doing just that, this is the first time he's going to be on the show, and I hope to bring him on so many more times, is Chairman Mark Green of the House Homeland Security Committee. And he's going to go into detail about the threats that we are faced in our nation, how the Biden administration has failed to actually protect us. I say it's a dereliction of duty on the part of the president. He needs to be there for the American people. We cannot afford, we cannot afford to go into this chaos any further. And I think we all know it, we all feel it, but what what can we do about it? What, as citizens, what is it that we can do to protect our children, to protect our families, to protect our community, ourselves, our nation. We're going to talk to Chairman Mark Green about that and so much more. So you're not going to want to go anywhere. You're not going to want to go anywhere at all. You're going to want to hear what he has to say because we have some major threats. And guess what? He has some breaking news to share with Sarah Carter listeners exclusively right here on The Sarah Carter Show. I want to thank Allegiance Gold. Um, Allegiance Gold is a sponsor of The Sarah Carter Show and makes it possible that I can bring on these incredible guests to share exclusive news with you. And one of the reasons why I appreciate Allegiance Gold is because Allegiance Gold gives you an opportunity to diversify your money, right? Your savings, what you have worked so hard for your whole life. And we've seen what's happened all over the globe. We've seen what's happened here at home with banks imploding on themselves. We've seen in Canada where the government has taken control and seized control of bank accounts of its citizens. We've seen in the United States where some banking institutions are trying to push out people that they don't agree with. These woke banks, this woke ideology, it's like a war between the sane and the insane. I don't know how to explain it, but right now, now don't just trust me. I want you to do your own research. And I make that very very clear. You need to do your own research, but you are going to be stunned and impressed by Allegiance Gold because they offer you right now $5,000 of free silver on a qualifying purchase when you tell them that Sarah sent you. Yep. My friends at Allegiance Gold can help you protect your IRA, your 401k with physical gold and silver and have it delivered securely right to your front door. You can't beat that. They will educate you on the benefits of physical gold because they care and want to build a long-term relationship with you. Get $5,000 of free silver on a qualifying purchase when you tell them that Sarah sent you. So don't wait. Call or click today, 877-702-7272. That's 877-702-SARAH, S-A-R-A, or go to protectwithsarah.com. We can't control the Biden administration, but we can prepare. 877-702-7272. That's 877-702-SARAH, S-A-R-A, or protectwithsarah.com. I've got Congressman Mark Green on with us. It's the first time on the Sarah Carter Show. I am so happy to have you on, sir. You are um, you represent Tennessee's 7th District. I love Tennessee. I always tell yeah. Senator Marsha Blackburn, the great state of Tennessee, it's so beautiful. And you're also the chairman of the Homeland Security Committee. So thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Sarah. Great to be on the sh- on your on your show. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, I want to start off. Let's start off at the top with border security and what we've seen in our nation. And the reason I'm starting off with that is I just returned from New York City last week where I was covering stories where, you know, obviously the Biden administration has created such chaos at our border that we are seeing, I mean, just a tsunami, waves of people entering our country, 
those people, many of them without any resources whatsoever, being dispersed into our cities across the United States, in particular, New York City, where over 60,000 illegal migrants have been shoved into various housing. Um, I, I mean, I won't even say Section 8. They've removed veterans out of hotels. They've replaced them with illegal migrants. I was visiting schools, elementary schools, Chairman, where 83 in one case, 83 men were sleeping in a gym 10 feet away from children that were attending school and they lost their gym. Most Americans say this is absolute insanity. They can't believe what is happening in our country, but it continues to happen. What can we do? What are you doing to help mitigate this crisis? And what are you hearing up on Capitol Hill as far as like, will there ever be any slowdown under this administration? Well, <clears throat> to start, you know, and kind of frame how we got to where we are, we had the border, I, I won't say uh, totally under control, but the, the numbers that were coming across uh, the border, across the border after Trump implemented his migrant protection protocols and remain in Mexico and all this other stuff was a trickle. Uh, and, and what happened, this president, by the way, in just two years, has had more people come into the country than the last 12 years before. So you add Obama and you add Trump together, this president has already exceeded that. 5.5 um, million known encounters, 1.5 million known gotaways. Chief Ortiz tells us to add another 20% to that of people they just never see. Um, so it's we're talking almost, you know, seven, let's say seven, seven and a half million people that have come into the country in two years. That happened not because we cut the uh, number of Border Patrol agents. It, it happened not because we uh, cut the budget for Customs and Border Protect Protection. It, it happened because as soon as, uh, you know, Mayorkas and Biden got in charge, they cut all the policies and they basically signaled that the border was open. Migrants tested that, called home and said the border's open. And so people are pouring in, basically catching the leaves. So that's how we got to where we are. We just passed legislation that probably the most, no, it is the most conservative and the best, strongest border security bill in the history of the country. And we passed it two weeks ago on the floor of the House, sitting, waiting on the Senate to act on it. Will the Senate act on it? Probably not. I mean, to be completely honest, but, uh, you know, I hold out hope. They said they wouldn't vote for the D.C. crime bill. And after American uh, people told the Democrats how ridiculous that was, both the Senate voted on it. And Biden changed his mind and decided not to veto. He signed it into law. So what we've got to do is, is get the American people calling their Democrat senators and telling them pass the bill or pass something that we can take into conference committee and, and you know, come up with some, uh, you know, consensus. Um, but that that bill passed. I mean, it's it's sitting over there. The Republicans in the House are acting, whether it's passing a debt ceiling increase that's responsible and cuts the size of government or it's this or an energy bill or whatever, we're, we're getting things done. And, but I think the tragedy for so many Americans and correct me if I'm wrong, is the fact that we know we have lawmakers up on Capitol Hill that are doing their job like you and others. I know there are people in the Senate wanting to do the same thing, but we have the Dems in control of the Senate. You pass this bill and American people, and I'm not just talking Republicans, we're seeing Democrats now in New York City. I was in New York City in Brooklyn and Coney Island where people are saying, what is going on here? Why is our nation so upside down? I think they had a different idea of what Biden was than the reality of what the Biden administration really is. And you talked about all the numbers and those numbers are so significant because what they tell me as far as illegal migration into the country, that there is a dereliction of duty on the part of this president to fulfill his obligation to the United States based on what he is required to do as commander in chief. I mean, and not only that, Alejandro Mayorkas, and you've talked about this many times, Chairman. I mean, he should be removed from his position. So, 100%. so what is going on here? What is going on that our administration, the United States executive branch, is allowing our sovereignty to crumble, is avoiding following any kind of rule of law, and is blockading with, with its allies in the Senate, 
any common sense reforms that would change things for the better, especially for for the people in our nation, not just for the GOP, not just for conservatives, but for everyone. Do you ever figure out like what that is? Do y'all sit up on Capitol Hill saying, what are they doing? up? What are they doing? Why are they doing this? Well, I think it's a philosophical thing and then it's a power play. Uh, the philosophical thing is, is, you know, the, the Democrat leadership, at least, I can't speak for all Democrats, but, you know, this administration anyway, they can't tell a good guy from the bad guy. I mean, they're supporting the release of criminals in our cities. Uh, they're, they're basically wanting to do a deal with Iran. Um, they are okay with the drug cartel seizing control of our southwest border, making billions of dollars off trafficking humans and trafficking drugs. Um, they're content to allow 100,000 Americans to die every year to fentanyl overdose. Um, all, they just don't know a good guy from a bad guy. They, they're anti-cop. You know, they try to, uh, now that it's no longer in vogue, they, they try to say they never said defund the police. It's ridiculous. They're on, you know, video after video saying defund the police. They don't know the good guy from the bad guy. So it's a philosophical thing. Then from a political thing, from a power thing, I think they genuinely believe that these people will come here and vote Democrat. Uh, there's no other explanation for allowing you know thousands of Americans to die, uh, fentanyl to come in. I mean, and every this is what's really important for every American to understand. Every American is at risk. A little baby was crawling around on a VRBO floor in Florida and encountered fentanyl that had been left over from the previous tenant in that VRBO and died. Uh, how many people have children? You go to a hotel. I mean, everybody should be uh, petrified by this. Um, so, it, you know, it, it's twofold. Let me ask you this as chairman of Homeland Security, because I and I absolutely agree with you. We just lost um, a friend of our families, one of my my son in law's closest friends. Um, he died a, a roommate of his in Florida after he returned home from a vacation. A roommate of his in Florida gave him a, a pill that he said would help him sleep. He was coming back from Rio and uh, took the pill and never woke up. He graduated law school just a few weeks before oh that. God. Yeah, lost his life. Same thing, fentanyl, a fentanyl tablet. So let me ask you this. And I know there's certain things you cannot discuss. I mean, based on classification, you're chairman of the Homeland Security Committee. But our adversaries like China see what our government is doing at the border. And they are supplying those precursor chemicals and pushing them into Mexico. They're bringing them in by the boatloads. Um, the cartels are then mixing these pills and creating these counterfeit pills and that are ending up on our streets and pure fentanyl as well. And do you think this is a proxy war? In a sense, look, the Chinese are using the cartels as a proxy to target our nation. And our government is sitting back. Therefore, again, I say the president's dereliction of duty the one job that President Biden has to do is to protect the United States of America from enemies, foreign and domestic, right? His job is to protect our nation, and he is failing to do that. But it scares me that we're kind of asleep at the wheel and we're not realizing that our adversaries see our weakness and are using that weakness to target us. Absolutely. China is doing everything they can to you know, pump the fentanyl that we, we think there are around 160,000 uh, fentanyl producing labs in China. And the CCP tells us they can't find them. It's the most surveilled society on the planet. You know, in fact, there's been nothing like this in the history of mankind. Uh, they know what every single China, when a, a Chinese person, uh, uh, you know, a citizen in their country crosses the street out and jaywalks and it immediately affects their um, you know, social credit score. So uh, look, it, they're lying and they're doing this on purpose. Now, uh, historically, it, you know, combination of revenge from the opium wars when Britain was selling opium to China, probably, but more probably uh, they're doing everything they can to take down the United States as the global hegemon. They want, you know, there's an old Sun Tzu saying there can only be two tigers at the top of the mountain. And they are they want to be uh, setting the parameters of the world order. So this is just a part of China's effort to destabilize the United States. It's it's absolutely happening. And I'll I'll, I'll you know, break a little news here, too. Uh, we have someone who's told us 
you know, there are thousands of Chinese nationals that have crossed over this open southern border and just been released into the United States. And uh, someone at Border Patrol told us many of those are in the, you know, 25 to 30 year uh, age males who have prior experience with the PLA. So we're worried about the Chinese balloon. We really need to be worried about our southern border. I mean, if we were, were to go and defend Taiwan, uh, how many of those are saboteurs? Uh, how many of those are going to buy a drone off the shelf once they get here and uh, hand make a, with a 3D printer a delivery mechanism for some ammonium nitrate? I mean, it, look, this is this is insane what the president is doing. And he is. You are right. It's dereliction of duty, uh, to, to say the least. And we, we have a plan to, to show that to the American people over the next couple of months. Well, I, I'm very much looking forward to that because I think this is a such an important time in our history I think probably one of the most important times in modern history. If anything, we can look back at the past and say, are our adversaries preparing a battlefield? Let's not forget about the balloon, the spy balloon that we saw. That wasn't the first spy balloon. I believe the Chinese wanted us to see this one. I believe they are, you know, shaking us to our core saying, look, we kind of own you now, which they do. They own land in the United States, which I think is absolute insanity that we're selling, you know, our national security asset, a resource, which is our land, which is vital to us, to companies connected to the Chinese Communist Party and the People's Liberation Army. We've seen that here in Texas. Um, in my good home state of Texas, we saw 134,000 acres near Laughlin Air Base being sold. We saw it up in North Dakota. I talked many times to Governor Stitt about this and all the land that's been purchased in Oklahoma. It's got to be a, a serious concern. And I know it is for you because the first time that I actually really had a chance to talk to you, we were both in Mexico City. And one of the things that you said to me that I think is just so brilliant, and it's been something that I've been thinking of for so long, is why aren't we bringing jobs back to America? Why are we emboldening our adversaries like China and giving them all of our resources, as well as our, you know, antibiotics and everything else that's being produced over there? I mean, we're, we're really we're really at their beck and call, right? If anything we're happens, dependent. we're dependent on them. So tell me a little bit about what you're doing with that reshoring, nearshoring, which I think is vital to the Western Hemisphere, could help build up our allies, could help us destroy the cartels with our allies here in the Western Hemisphere. So much more we could be doing. Yeah. So uh, I have a bill, a nearshoring bill that would break our dependency on Chinese manufacturing by moving that manufacturing I have a separate bill that moves it to the United States, but there are some business models where the labor costs wouldn't make sense coming back to the United States. So in those cases, let's break that dependency on China and move it to Latin America. The, the additional benefit of moving it to Latin America is you, you create opportunity in Latin America and it lessens the migration into the United States. So there's a win, win, win there. Uh, but yeah, I have a bill also that uh, expenses the move from from China to the United States in year one, which is a huge financial uh, benefit to a company that makes that choice. And so we want them to come back to the to the country. Uh, if they can't afford the labor costs in the United States, then go to Latin America, make it in Guatemala. That's right. I think Guatemala is a great choice. I think we have a lot of allies in Guatemala. I also believe that we're losing a lot of our partners in Central America under this no administration doubt. to China, which I've, I've, I've actually questioned, you know, and I'm not going to say who yet, but I will be interviewing leaders in Central America soon, but questioned their outreach to China. And what, what I will hear on from our partner side or from other nation states is like, listen, I, I heard it in Hungary when I was recently in Budapest. It's like, well, we have a different mindset on China. And I said, yes, but China never comes freely. China always comes, uh, they hand something to you and they expect something back, right? Yeah. And usually they expect something back targeting one of your allies like us. So right now we're watching China spread across Central America and move its way into Mexico. So I'm absolutely 100% on board with anything we can do to kind of win back our neighbors. And how, how serious is that to you? I mean, when you look at it in, from, from the perspective of homeland security, 
How serious is this an issue that we win back the Western Hemisphere for the United States, that we play the dominant role here and not China? Well, just look at Brazil, an excellent example of how Lula has taken that government to the left. And they just recently decided to do trade with China off the U.S. dollar, which harms the U.S. dollar, right, which weakens the U.S. dollar and leads uh, when the value of the dollar goes down. Since we uh, import 75 percent of the things that we use in this country, that just makes the inflation worse. So, I mean, that is a an economic strike at the United States by by wooing one of the largest economies in the world. I think uh, Brazil is like the seventh or ninth, something like that. It's a it's a big economy. Uh, they also have a hundred ship blue water Navy. So it's, it's crazy that they're partnering up with China when they really should be, you know, partnering up with us. So it's a, it's a geopolitical strategic threat to the United States, but it's also an economic threat. Um, so, and this has all happened under Joe Biden's watch because, um, you know, they hate, they hate conservatives. They love leftists. And that's so that's such an important point. It has happened under his watch. And we still have I mean, my gosh, there's still a lot of time before 2024 for him to do some serious damage or for this administration to do some serious damage. So between now and then, I think what is it that Americans can do as far as supporting lawmakers who are pushing bills in the right direction Or is there something that they, I know, this is one of the biggest questions I get, Congressman, is I don't know what to do. I I want to be more involved. I want to be able to get more active, you know, with with local politics, but I don't know what to do. And I always say, well, you got to support the right candidates, donate to their campaigns, you know, help get them elected to office. Is there anything else that they can be doing? I mean, especially when you think of Homeland Security. Yeah, absolutely. They can email their congressman. I mean, most of the official web pages have a place or an email address on there for people to communicate with their congressman, and everybody should be doing that. And it's it's one thing if a congressman gets 10 emails. It's another thing if they get 10,000. Right. Uh, and so the more people that can communicate with their congressman say, hey, look, close the border. This is ridiculous. Or, uh, you know, stop... Uh, plan maybe Pamby with China, you know, all that kind of stuff, whatever they're going to say, whatever their, their point is, just make that in an email right off the web page. You can, you can make a phone call too. phone calls and emails are great. The other thing you can do is most congressmen, congresswomen go back to their districts and have town halls, show up at a town hall, ask the hard questions um, and, and communicate the, look, if you don't support what I, what I want to see is the outcome here, we're going to work to make sure you're no longer our congressman. I mean, you, you be bold, tell people what you're going to do, and then then you go out and campaign against them. And, and that's, you know, raising money and uh, putting up signs and knocking on doors for those candidates that you want to support. So that that needs to happen a lot more. I look, I agree with you. And I say it all the time on the podcast. I know everyone who's listening to this right now. I know you all are. I have heard me say it over and over again. But the congressional members that I know, the ones that are actually doing their job, they do really listen. Again, thank you for joining me today. If you love the interviews we do here at The Sarah Carter Show and you want more in-depth interview with congressional leadership like Chairman Mark Green, subscribe to my channel here on YouTube and on Rumble. Believe me, I won't disappoint you. And follow me on Facebook and Twitter. See you. Thank you. In March, one of the things that I was so impressed by, you held that Homeland Security hearing in McAllen, Texas. I drove all the way down there to see this hearing. Um, It was about a four-hour drive for me, four and a half hours. Um, Why is it sometimes necessary, do you think, to hold field hearings like the one that you had? Yeah, field hearings allow us to get a sort of ground level view of what's going on. Uh, And I I just learned a long time ago that leaders should lead from the front. Uh, And, you know, the the CEO sits in his office and never goes down to the manufacturing floor or uh, the the chief nursing officer who never goes to the ICU doesn't have a good picture of what's going on. So we went down and did our hearing at the border, got ground level information. We met with uh, a big group of sheriffs right before the hearing. We had uh, two different hearings. One was with law enforcement and DPS, the Texas uh, Department of Public Safety, that is fighting that battle at the border. Uh, And, of course, we've done many tours along the border 
So it was it was a great hearing and very successful. That's where Chief Ortiz admitted that we didn't have control of our border, uh, which I deeply appreciated his honesty. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it was it was very beneficial and just got to get that ground level view. Yeah. Chief Ortiz is great. I've had an opportunity to meet him several times and I know he's he's been dealt a hard blow um, and, and many times he's been criticized. But he was very honest at that hearing and uh, surprisingly honest and really held the administration accountable. I was grateful that he didn't lie. This is one of the issues, I think, too, that we've been dealing with a lot, and it's non-governmental organizations. I know we've seen that at the border. We've seen it throughout Central America. Um, Non-governmental organizations or NGOs and private charities that incentivize illegal immigration to America. It's it's kind of a bizarre turn of events, you know? We even see it from the United Nations. Is the committee looking at some of that and possibly looking at how some groups are being incentivized to maybe push migration in our direction? Yes, in fact, we passed uh, legislation in our bill two weeks ago to defund any money going to NGOs that were supporting lodging, uh, and uh, providing legal services, because what's happening is, as you're right, it's an incentive for people to come. It makes it nice and comfortable. And what, what really is the frustrating thing for us is uh, Mayorkas has stopped sending people to ICE detention. Those ICE detention beds cost the government about 120 bucks a night. Uh, instead, they're giving them to the NGOs to buy them hotel rooms, which costs $400 a night. So it's uh, and there's some questions about what's really going on there that we'll be digging into uh, over the coming weeks, but um, very clearly, you know, quickly facilitating people out of government control prevents them from being returned. So when you put them in ICE detention, if uh, a uh, query back to the country of origin shows that they're a criminal, you can actually, you have them in detention, you can actually return them. Right. But if they're in a hotel run by an NGO, you don't have control over them. And by the time you get the information back, and we found that in thousands of cases, those individuals have been just released into the country. And we articulate this to Secretary Mayorkas, and he just doesn't care. That's what's incredible. I, I can absolutely back you on this. I have talked to Immigration and Customs Enforcement officers that are saying the exact same thing to me. And Border Patrol agents are also backing up those, those accusations. People are just being released they're not even having full security checks done on on any of the people that they're releasing. If they don't ping a U.S. database, they're released into the country. Very final question, because I know you got to go. You have another hit at the top of this hour. But um, the three as as chairman of the Homeland Security Committee, what are the three most, I guess, cons- biggest concerns that you have for our country as far as security? And you can just. Name them quickly, and I promise you I will bring you back to go into detail. Maybe we already sure, talked about sure. it. Well, obviously, the issues related to the southern border with uh, you know fentanyl, it's, it's the number one killer for kids 18 to 45 uh, years old. So that, that's probably number one. Number two would be the risk to the country you know, with terrorists and Chinese, you know, our enemies coming across the southern border. And then third would be our cyber border. Our cyber border is very porous. There are a lot of issues we've discovered. So uh, we're launching a uh, a couple of initiatives that I can come back and talk about later on how we're we're addressing cyber issues. And I think cyber issues are so important. And I'm sorry we did not get there, but I think they're at the top of the list as well. We've seen that um, from social media to our own Internet and our Pentagon and everywhere else. Thank you so much, uh, Chairman Green. I, Thanks for having me. Oh, anytime, anytime. I look forward to having you on again soon. Thank you. Okay, so earlier this morning, I was on with um, the chicks on the right. I almost said the Dixie chicks again. Everybody laughs at me when I do that. But chicks on the right, they are not the Dixie chicks. It's Mock and Daisy. They're amazing. They're funny. They're even better than the Dixie chicks. But I'm sick. I have been sick now for like a few days. My husband gave it to me. He's the first one to be sick. He's been sick now for like four days. I've got a runny nose. I'm stuffy. I had a fever of 101.4 last night. I was like, am I going to make it through this? It looks like I did. I made it through the podcast. (coughs) You might not be seeing me on Sean's show tonight, but I just wanted to disclose that because I was laughing with the gals this morning. Um, They were saying, well, it actually sounds kind of sexy. And I thought, well, you know, if, if this is what sexy sounds like, 
um, then I don't know what to say. I just, I've lost my mind, right? I, it's, I, to me, I just want to get over it. I'm so tired of being sick and it's a summer cold. Anyways, follow me on Truth at Sarah Carter Official on Twitter at Sarah Carter DC and on Instagram at S Carter DC. Look, God bless you. God bless our great nation. God bless everyone out there, all of our law enforcement officials who are doing everything to protect us from the insanity that they and we are being faced with in the Biden administration. And God bless the great state of Texas, by the way, and Tennessee. Thank you, Chairman Green, for coming on the show. <laughs>